Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters and viewers of Ikra TV, welcome to another program, another episode of Real Talk. I hope that the last one that we had last week was really interesting to you and you found the information that we discussed around post-mortems and, and imaging, etc., very useful because the person who came has been championing that issue for a long, long time. We try and bring to on this program people who have made a difference to the lives of Muslims in this world, in this country, and other parts of the world as well. And every week when I, when I come to your, into your homes, I say I have a special guest with me today. And every one of them is really special. But today, I really, really, really have an, a special guest. I consider him to be my ustad, my mentor, a man who has set the standards of how Muslims should respond to broadcasting either on radio or TV. A man who has made a huge difference to the understanding of Muslims and Muslim communities and what their thoughts are around being British citizens you know, for, for a long, long time. Who anchored a massively successful program on Ummah TV called Debate Night. Now that I mentioned that, I'm sure many of you will know who it is. I'm really, really happy that my Ustad, my friend, my mentor is here today to share his life, his thoughts, his ideas, his vision for the future with every one of us who are viewers and members of Ikra TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brother, brother Muhammad Iqbal, Shafiq, thank you so much for that welcome, to, uh, welcome to Ikra TV I'm not and worthy Real of Talk. The kind words. Oh, definitely. More than that, I wish. How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. I know when I used to come on your program, you used to, you used to pull my leg about traveling across the Pennines. I have, I've got a visa. You've got um, a visa. I've got a one-night visa. You've managed to get here uh, without... From Lancashire to Yorkshire, so uh, I'm very grateful for you for putting a quiet word. We are very generous. <laughs> you know, we put a, I think we put a, a sponsorship uh, application yeah. a very long time ago. It was... Really nice to have it's you here. It's great to be on, and I know it's something which we've, we've been talking about for a while, so it's great to... Uh, Quite a while. I mean, obviously, you do a lot of TV. I do, indeed, You do yeah. a lot of radio, and I'm sure some of our viewers will know that every Saturday night, you're on Radio 5 Live, you know, discussing current issues yeah. with no less than Edwina Curry herself, who, um, you know, who many, some, of, some of the young people may not know her, but she was a very prominent member of the she Conservative was. Party for a long time, and she was a minister as well. And the banter that you, know, you generate is quite interesting and quite challenging for her at times. I mean, how did you get into the media? Um, I think I first started uh, when I was 18. I went to work right. in the House of Commons uh, for a Liberal Democrat MP who was a member of the Lib Dems at the time. Um, I was just fascinated by politics and uh, public service because my father, my late father, was a, uh, was a community activist. He set up an Islamic centre in Rochdale. Um, in the early 80s, he was one of the pioneers, if you like, of the Muslim community in Rochdale. Right. And I think it was something which I inherited from him. He died when I was uh, 10. Oh, uh, yeah, but I had yeah. that passion and desire to serve the community, right. to be outward looking and to really think about how we can make our lives better. But mm. at the same time, think of the society around us. Um, and politics was a kind of a vehicle uh, which gets people excited. You know, you're, you, you, you have an interest in politics. Um, the personalities, uh, mm. you know, the policy debates, uh, the discussions, values and principles right. um, and how you can apply your Islamic faith in that mm. environment. So it kind of started from there. Uh, so working very young age at the age very of young, 18, 18 you Yeah, many years ago. Right. Um, it you're was still very young. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah. likewise, yeah. And you're, looking, you're looking even younger the more, <laughs> the, every time I see you, I mean, I saw you just before Ramadan and you're looking younger today. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So What's the secret? The secret, I don't know. I just keep going. Do you? Uh, I think when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you and your work is good, your intentions are clean, mm. uh, Allah blesses you in your work um, and you continue to uh, seek a benefit for that. And obviously, I mean, Muhammad Shafiq has been seen around the world. It's not just in the UK. I mean, you know, every time there's an issue around Muslims and Islam, you know, the BBC, ITV, Sky TV, RTE, Russian TV, CNN, you know, the go he's the go-to man when it comes to talking about Muslims and Islam. Oh, well, Daniel Han in the MEP calls me rent a gob. Oh, is it? Hunter? Yeah, he's called me a rent a gob. So, uh, because uh, on certain occasions, you suddenly turn on all the channels, BBC, Sky, ITV, CNN, yeah. uh, and I think he was in Brussels, and he was watching the British channels, and then suddenly 
he switched over from British channels and switched on CNN and suddenly my mishfeek popped up. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, also known as Rentagob. So I, well I, take, I, I take that as a badge, I, of, badge I, of honor. I, I was going to say that that should be you know, a badge of honor Absolutely. that you should wear. Because there's not many Muslims who have reached that level, that status, where, you know, you, they can... Not, I mean, there are people who want to get onto the media, media platform, but they don't have the same ability or the nouns to be able to represent the Muslim community in the way you do. I mean, what's been the most challenging thing that you've done? I think the most challenging is, is uh, public scrutiny. Right. Because uh, when you're on TV, you know, you'll, you'll get it now as a TV presenter here on Ikra. Uh, you are a public face. And when you make public statements, uh, there'll be people who agree with your uh, opinion and there'll be people who disagree with your opinion. So let's take child sexual exploitation and grooming. I was the very first person I know, I was uh, in mention that, 2007 yes. who decided that these despicable crimes where predominantly Pakistani uh, gangs were raping young white teenagers, mm -hmm. children, uh, I thought was despicable. And mm -hmm. as a father of four daughters, I just imagined the pain and anguish those families were going through. So I kind of spoke to a number of scholars. My younger brother, Sheikh Umar, is uh, uh, the chairman of the Ramadan Foundation, but he's a scholar mm -hmm. as well. I spoke to him and I spoke to another uh, a few scholars that I knew, uh, Jabundi brothers that I knew, and said, look, what is, you know, what wh what should our approach on this be? And they said, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about standing up against injustice, even if it's against your own clan, right. your family. And so go, uh, go ahead and, and be outspoken on that. Um, but so it's they an, empowered you? Yeah, empowers you, but I, I think the difficulty is you had the far right, the EDL, the BMP, who was saying this is just a Pakistani Muslim problem. Mm. And then you had people in the Muslim community, Pakistani community predominantly, who were saying, oh, well, this is a far right conspiracy. Mm. And then you had somebody like me in the middle who was shouting, uh, you know, that if we don't address it, then it gives oxygen to the far right. I think that's been the most difficult thing, the scrutiny that comes with being a public figure, mm. in that when you express yourself on a particular topic, um, it kind of puts you in a, in a, in a, in, in a box. And where how, people how has that affected you personally? Has it affected you personally? Um, I see myself as a champion of the Muslim community. Right. Um, I don't see myself as somebody um, who represents the Muslim community. I think there's a real distinction between that because uh, unlike some other spokespeople mm. or people who appear in the media um, who don't live in the community, I'm embedded in the community. I live in Rochdale. I've lived all my life uh, pretty much there. Mm. Uh, I have contacts around the country. Um, so um, I'm known in the community and respected in the community. And I mm. think that carries a lot of weight. Um, but I think the wider issue is how you articulate what you've got to say in a more responsible well, way. Well, obviously, you've been very brave. And I know I've, we've discussed this on your previous program, mm. Debate Night, grooming, child sexual exploitation, yeah. etc., including, you know, terrorism and extremism, and, you know, people going to Syria. And I know that, you know, you've not shied from that. But, you know, you were empowered by some of the scholars that you say. Yeah. But do you feel that on some of these issues, and we, we're going through the... There's a debate around uh, criminality within mm. the, uh, the Muslim community at the moment, regardless of the ethnicity. Do you think that we have not learned our lesson? Have we learned a lesson from the experience of CSE, grooming, etc.? That we're still sweeping things under the carpet? So I don't know if you, people have seen the, the, the um, documentary on BBC Three. Uh, uh, home killing. Home killing yes. about the uh, endemic of uh, drug mm. dealing uh, amongst our predominantly Pakistani yes. Asian community. Um, the immediate aftermath instead of talking about the issue of criminality, gun crime mm. and drugs, uh, our community was engaged in a debate about the presenter, the, the mm. reporter, Mubin Azhar, his personal life, you know, how he dressed and how he uh, lives his life, you mm. know. And I, I, think that's, I think that's part of our problem. Mm. The, the defences come up, we feel yeah. under attack, and therefore we think when you're under attack, what you do, you attack. You back, yes. um, and I'm disappointed that a number of scholars themselves on social media have been engaged in that character assassination without addressing the real issue. Right. Uh, there's a big problem in Yorkshire mm. uh, of drugs. Don't take the views of uh, the presenter of that programme or you or me or anybody else. Mm. Look at the statistics. The statistics tell mm. a, a, a bleak story yes. and I think we've got to address that. And that's why it's important that imams, mosques and community organisations stand up and speak up. I mean, obviously, I mean, going back a few years, this is that you started discussion and debating and championing and challenging issues around CSE, child sexual exploitation. Uh, sorry, just you, you know this because yeah. you were... I was uh, on your program. You were always on my program. Yes. And uh, the amount of backlash I would get and challenge, mm. so you would get important people within the British Muslim community ringing you up saying, do you really want to talk about that? 
Mm. Terrorism, do you really want to talk about it? Uh, you know, uh, any particular issue, abortion we talked about, yeah. uh, which was increasing in the Northwest amongst Muslims, young Muslim girls, uh, mm. were a massive increase in, in the areas of Blackburn and Lancashire mm. in terms of who were using abortion. Mm. That's a shocking statistic. I, I, I don't know if you remember that. But yes. I got calls from people telling me not to do those programmes. And you do get a lot of pressure that's from the community who say, are you bringing shame on the community yeah. rather than looking at the criminals who are the exactly. real culprits? So, I mean, so basically coming back, after all these years and all these issues that we've gone through, do you feel that we still haven't learned the lessons from the past and that our ulama, our scholars and our community leaders are still hiding behind this mask of, you know, not, it's not a big issue. There are a few, you know, bad apples in our community and we don't need to really discuss this, you know, in the, in the, in the open. And that is something that's confronted, you know, people like you and me for a lo very long time. What do you think? I mean, being in the broadcast media, you are one of, one of the only one that I see who champions this. We need more people like you. How can we get young people to come forward? Where are the opportunities for them to come forward and engage with the media? I, I think it's difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm fortunate in that you build relationships with a lot of these journalists, producers, editors, people mm. behind the scenes. You have a, a, a dialogue with them and a connection with them. So whenever there's an issue, they, they, they know who to go to and who to speak to. But it's about passion and it's about um, you thinking about a career. And, and really, we're starting to see it. Fatima Manja uh, on Channel 4, Mehdi Hassan, uh, who's doing a successful career at Al Jazeera. You've got um, uh, Asad Beg, for example, who was on Channel 4, who's now on TRT World. Uh, there are people now coming through the ranks, right. uh, Michal Hussein on, on BBC Radio 4. So there are uh, Muslims who well, are coming been through. Zed but Zena, Zena, Zena Badawi has been around yeah, yeah. for a very long time, but, but, but they've not been championing like you, an yeah. ambassador for Islam. I, I think if you want to be an ambassador for Islam, you can't work in these institutions. Right. And I think the success for me has been that I've always been... Um, You're independent. Independent, yes. and I'm not being part. And, and I, when you join an organisation, you can then have to you know, uh, understand their rules and procedures. But when you're a guest, it gives you that freedom uh, to express yourself. And, and I, I think the important thing is uh, the media is a tool. And that's why you have channels like Ikra TV and, uh, you know, all the other mm. Muslim channels who are giving a platform to utilize them platforms, you know, as you do now on your program. I mean, it's starting from your career, obviously you started off like a, a working for a politician. Yeah. You know, a, a member of parliament, the Liberal Party. Where did that transition take place from being a, uh, sort of a PA, you know, a personal assistant or a personal advisor yeah. or a political advisor. Political that, advisor, know, yeah. Political advisor to a member of parliament from that to the media itself. You know, how, so how and it when was, did that transition um, take place? In 2004, myself and some brothers decided that we wanted to set up the Ramadan Foundation. My father was called Ramadan, so we decided to uh, have a tribute to him and call it the Ramadan Foundation. The organisation, we were kind of talking about setting it up. And then July the 7th happened mm. and our launch was going to be on August the 7th, right. uh, 2005, at the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester called a Muslim Unity Convention. It was the first time in the history of this country that we brought together uh, Jubandis, Tablikis, uh, Shia, uh, all different firkas together right. on one platform to talk about Marshall, the issues yeah. that bind us together. Uh, not the issues that divide mm. us. So if we're going to talk about the issues that divide us, we're not going to unite. But let's put them to a side and each to their own. Mm. Let's unite on the things that uh, how we have come and uh, bond mm. together. And July the 7th happened. And it so happened, the producer of Sky News, um, Anjum Chaudhry was on Sky News the evening right. of the July the 7th bombing. Um, and I was absolutely furious with that. I thought, out of all the two million Muslims in this country, mm. the best you can do is bring on an extremist voice like right. Anjum Chaudhry. And I was furious enough that I picked up the phone and I, I spoke to my friend who works for, uh, who, who worked at Sky News as a news producer. And I said, look, what are you doing? You know, and he said, well, nobody else wants to come on. People were quite scared. They were fearful. Because uh, remember, we hadn't experienced this. That was the first, you know, we had September our 11th. Our equivalent of 9-11. Our equivalent of 9-11, yeah. uh, a homegrown uh, terrorist attack mm. carried out. You would have felt it a lot more mm. because you were in Bartley and Dewsbury from where some of the bombers were from. And so people were fearful that the shutters mm. had come down. And so he said to me, well, if you think you can do a better job, come on. All right. And I was like, OK, yeah. yeah. And so he arranged for a cameraman to be sent to my house and uh, the camera was set up. And um, I must have done well enough because the feedback, we didn't have social media then, Twitter or Facebook. 
Um, but from the text messages I got and the comments I got from the community, it was very positive. Mm. And you, you're able to address the issue from our faith point of view, which yeah. is terrorism is evil. Exactly. Human life is sacred, whatever it is. And well, anybody you see, the general media does not want people like you. Yeah. They want people like the Antim Chaldees yeah. and you know, the people from the Quilliam Foundation <laughs> you know, who are going to attack the Muslim community yeah. or who are going to be very, very sort of extremist in their views about non-Muslims like Anjum Chaudhary. Mm. So very, very few people like you get opportunities to, to put the, yeah. the, the counter narrative there, right? And it so just took off from there, I think. Yeah. I, I, you know, we had our, um, I did that interview and then BBC got in touch suddenly and, and, and it, it kind of ballooned into when, when we had our launch event uh, at the Bridgewater Hall, uh, the sense of unity and purpose in terms of the org uh, organizations and the scholars from across mm. the world who came together. You've never seen that, um, right, you yes. know, uh, on one platform, actually right. holding hands and saying, you know what, we, we're going to confront this evil of terrorism. But at the same time, we're not going to compromise on our faith. Mm. We're not going to compromise on our practices and our freedoms to, you mm. know, the great British uh, values of individual liberty and freedom. We're not going to compromise on that. And if you attack our community, we're going to stand up and speak up. And so um, I think a few months later, Tony Blair had a, re had a meeting in Downing Street of all the Muslim leaders. Um, uh, and I somehow, uh, probably because of all the media was doing at the time, uh, you know, got invited to come and speak to the Prime Minister about those issues. Mm. Um, you know, saying to him, look, absolutely, we are with you. You know, you take two steps forward against terrorism, we'll, we'll take three steps with you. Right. You know, it's as evil and barbaric to us as it is to you. But when you start attacking our scholars, when you start saying to people who might have different viewpoints, you know, conservative viewpoints as extremist and a violent extremist, and when mm. you start attacking the Muslim community, then there's, we're, we're going to speak up. duplication in the way they were yeah, portraying Yeah, and, and you have community. to speak up, and right. alhamdulillah, I think that's been a consistent approach for me, which is, uh, there's, there's critical questioning, which you have to subject yourself to, mm. uh, and you know this is, uh, I've worked in you know, high places within government, that you've, you've got to have the answers to that, mm. but at the same time, uh, you know, if you've got an anti-Muslim agenda, then you know, we're not going to play that game with you. Right, I mean, since you started 2004 or five, you know, yeah. and you, you've sort of moved on and you've been all the media. And it's not just some of the Western media that you've been on and anchored programs. Yeah. I mean, Mohammed Shafiq has also done programs for the Middle East as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know there's another equivalent there channel is, called International Ikra Ikra. TV International. Yeah. And I know you do some programs for them as well. I do, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and, uh, I really enjoy doing programs. I know, uh, I know. I've, I've, seen, I've seen some of those programs yeah. as well. And there's, I, this, there's, I, a, there's a surprise <laughs> uh, appearance by somebody called Iqbal Bana. I, well, um, I know. I mean, we put you in the, under the microscope yeah, in I your mean, life. I know. I You're mean, fantastic I, I, was, I wasn't expecting all that. And yeah. I'm not sure the viewers would want I'm to a, see I'm it. A, I might tweet the, the, tweet the link. Viewers would not want to see it. <laughs> anyway, this boring stuff. But no. I mean, well, I want to come back to you. We're going to be going to for a break now. But in that time, the shift against Muslims in Islamophobia has actually grown, hasn't yes, it? Yes, it has, yes. Since absolutely. when you first started. And I want to come and talk about the media's role in that. Because you've been, at the f you've been very at the forefront of that. We need to go for a break. Inshallah, we'll come back soon. I hope you found the first part. I mean, absolutely entertaining, really informative. But don't go away. Make yourself a tea or coffee. We'll be back soon, Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.